My old bench slash outfeed assembly table was in major need of an upgrade. So today I want to build an all-in-one solution that'll both stand the test of time and look good doing so on Timber Biscuit. So if you've seen my channel before, you may know that my old bench has become my outfeed slash assembly table since I built my split top Rubo a few months ago. So today the goal is to build a better assembly table that will fit better in my current workshop setup and give me plenty of space for the future. So currently I store a lot of tools underneath my outfeed assembly table and what I want to do is build a smarter way to keep those tools all wrangled. So my old bench was an MDF top with an all-in-one kind of setup. And not surprisingly, over time the MDF has sagged and it's become a bit more cumbersome to get the tools in and out of it. Now another thing that's really impacted my decision is the fact that I don't really use my miter saw all that frequently. So the plan here is to store that miter saw up and under the assembly table to get it out of the way. As far as tools go, it doesn't really weigh a whole lot, so getting it out from underneath the assembly table shouldn't be all that difficult when I need it. The other plan here is to conceal my small compressor underneath the assembly table. This way, when the compressor kicks on, it'll be a little bit more muffled and it won't shake the entire house. Well, at least that's the hope. So I think that covers most of the goals for now, but throughout the video, I'll dive more into why I'm making the decisions I'm making and what I did and didn't like about my old assembly table. So first things first, what I needed to do here is just break down my sheet goods. So the goal here is to cut all my sheet goods down to their final length while keeping the width slightly over. And this is because the joinery I'm going to use for this table is going to be dados and rabbits, as long as I don't break the camera in the process. Whoa. Now being that I'm using 3 quarter inch Baltic birch, it's slightly under 3 quarters of an inch, so I don't want to go for my final dimensions right now. What I'm going to do is cut those dados and rabbits and use those to reference for my final width. And don't worry if that doesn't make sense right now, it will in a minute. So once I had all my sheet goods cut down with the track saw, I could go ahead and cut down my smaller parts over at the table saw. And once I had all my pieces cut to rough dimension, I go ahead and set up my dado stack. And I just like to do that on a flat surface using my fingertip to set the height. And for my European viewers, if you're not allowed to have a dado stack, you could always cut these dados and rabbits or rebates with a router bit. You have metric, we have massive discs of death. Win-win. Alright, so with my Doom discs installed, the first thing I needed to do was cut a couple tests. Here what I'm looking for is a nice flush quarter inch depth, and I want to have a tiny amount of wiggle room within the data itself. And this is because plywood's not always perfectly flat, but it's mostly flat, and we want to make sure that there's plenty of wiggle room in there once we have glue for the joint to seat properly. And that'll be especially important with the assembly of this piece, being that these are such large panels. So make sure you take the time to get a nice fit that's somewhere in between snug and a little loose. Now again, because of the panel sizes, I asked my wife to come in and help me out with a couple of the pieces just to make sure that they stayed flush against the fence. And then from there, what I could do is just mark out on my boards where those rabbits and dados should live so that I don't go back and mess them up later on and then get back to cutting my dados. So the lower portion of this cabinet is going to sit three inches off the ground, while the upper portion is going to give me four inches for a small shelf. Now, this is cool for a couple of reasons. A, it will allow me to clamp pieces directly to the top of the assembly table, and B, it'll give me somewhere to store clamps when I'm in the midst of a glue-up frenzy, as we know all great woodworkers have. <clears throat> anyway, the next step was to lay out the center divider for my drawers. And to do that, what I'm going to do is find the center of my board, and then use an offcut to reference to make sure I've got everything aligned in the middle. I like using a scrap piece more than just trying to attempt to guess where that center should be, because I think lining it up this way gives me more accurate results. From there, I can just take that measurement over to my table saw and adjust my fence accordingly. Now, one other thing I like to do when cutting dados like this is to use a featherboard when I can. The featherboard helps keep the piece against the fence, much like my wife did earlier. Thank you, honey. Or using a vertical featherboard, I can keep downward pressure on the joint to make sure everything stays flush across the entire cut. And again, when cutting dados that are wide like this, it definitely helps to have another person there just to help keep things against the fence. Because while I can try to do this by myself, just like a boat full of buddies, things are easier with a friendship. And if you dig dad jokes and woodworking like I do, be sure to give this video a like. This way, the video can spread to more people. Thanks for your support. All right, so with the sacrificial fence attached to my existing fence, I could go ahead and cut the rabbits into my side panels. Now, one thing I didn't mention earlier is that because these vertical partitions align at the bottom shelf and the top shelf in the same sections, I'm going to go ahead and cut those dados slightly more shallow. So instead of being a quarter inch, they're going to be 3 16 of an inch. This way there's still enough material between the dado to give me the support that I want, but the vertical partition won't lose the structure. So ultimately what that means is the lower shelf and upper shelf is going to be slightly varied, so cutting those to the exact width is going to be even more important, so again, it's a good thing we left those long. Now because I'm obviously moving the fence between these cuts, what I did was just cut my 4 and 3 inch grooves and a small offcut, and earlier you saw me use that to realign the fence. 
So with all of our dados cut, I could cut out another two pieces of scrap with the dado in it to size my shelf panels. Now again here I was careful that I referenced the right depth of the dados since we have two different depths going on. And while I'm talking about all these details, let me know down in the comments if you guys want plans for this project. And if there's enough interest, I'll post them in the description of this video as well as update you guys with the community post. So with the width all marked out, I could then take the piece back over to my table saw and cut it to its final width. Now on two of the shelves, the width is going to be exactly the same since they have the same depth of dados. However, on the right shelf, that's not the case, so I have to take that measurement two times. Now the cool thing about doing it this way is you don't have to work off of any single measurement. All I'm doing here is aligning that mark to the edge of my saw blade and making the cut. This takes a lot of guesswork and mistakes out of this cut and creates a perfectly spaced shelf without any real measuring, which is a win. So the last horizontal piece to cut is the lower shelf that goes below the drawers. And again, I'll just mark that out and cut it to width based off my data placement. From there, I need to take two notches out of my rabbit. This is because the shelf runs the full width of the cabinet. And if I didn't do this, I'd have to cut stop dados and cutting these notches is just a heck of a lot easier. Plus they'll be concealed by the edge banding. So you'll never really know they're there. So to cut those, I just notched them out first over at the bandsaw, taking some small bites to create some relief cuts. From there, I'll take the piece over to my old bench and knock out those reliefs using some chisels. Now normally here I'd put some sort of sacrificial board underneath my workpiece, but since this bench is about to be destroyed, I don't think we really have to worry about it. In any case, I'm just using some light taps from a mallet to remove that material. And once I felt like I had a nice fit, I could grab another scrap piece and test everything out. Yeah, that'll work. So next it was time to assemble this case. And what I'm first going to do is lay out some lines so that I know where the center of my rabbits and dados are. This is so I can use some brad nails and glue to hold everything together. The other thing I'll do is attach some squares to my first panel to ensure I have a good start. And for the glue on this one, I'm going to use something with a long open time and working time so that I have plenty of time to put everything together. And in case I didn't emphasize it enough, time was pretty important here. And that's because with a case glue up this large, there's a lot of clamps and different parts to check. So I want to give myself plenty of padding to get all those pieces in. So once I had my first piece attached with some clamps and I was confident that everything was square, I went ahead and drove in some brad nails. And then from there, I just worked my way through the panels from top to bottom. Now because these dados, again, are really long, we made sure that there was plenty of space for them to fit. Now that's not to say that everything just comes together perfectly. Sometimes you gotta muscle things in with some clamps or a mallet, but eventually things did get there. And again, this is where choosing your adhesive is pretty important. Because you don't wanna get halfway through the assembly only to find out that things are already tacking up. And I use this glue for the majority of my cabinets, so I'll leave a link down in the description for anybody who's interested. Alright, so with my first three panels attached, everything was going pretty smoothly. Now this fourth panel was a little bit trickier. Since two of my panels were already set, I'd lock in these dados and squeeze everything pretty tight. Now my plan here was to do these boxes in sections. This way I could minimize the amount of clamps that I needed, and it would give me ample time to go from section to section. So once I got through with the first box, I checked everything for square, and yeah, it looks like we're doing something right and then let everything dry while I went and pitched my son's coach pitch baseball game. For the young baseball accustomed, that's roughly two and a half hours. Then when I returned from my outing, I went ahead and attached the next section. This time I did have an extra set of hands, which made things go a little bit quicker. Which was also nice because giving those five-year-olds the high heat was a little tiring, not to mention my malleting arm was a bit sore. So with that section all attached, I could drive in some brad nails into the dados and slide in my shelf and vertical partition for my drawers. From there, the only piece that was left was to attach the outer panel of the drawer case. And that was pretty straightforward since everything up to this point has been pretty square. And honestly, at this point, even if it wasn't, you just have to embrace your mistakes, just like I told my wife before she gave me a hug. And it's done. So I left the cabinet alone for the evening and let the glue dry. And the next day, I could take some measurements to cut out some stretchers. Now, the plan here is to put two stretchers across the front of the drawer faces and two stretchers along each gap for my shelves. This should give me plenty of structure, as well as give me something to screw into to attach the top. So over at the table saw, I first cut my stretchers to their final width. Then I set up my miter gauge and cut them down to their final length. Here, what I'm going for is the exact width of the space between my shelves. So I took that measurement directly off the case. This is another one of those times where you want to take your measurements off of your workpiece rather than looking at the plans. Because obviously between the build and the plan, there could be a little bit of variation. Alright, so the next step was to cut in some pocket holes. So I first just lay out the placement using a square, and then take the stretchers over to my pocket hole jig to plunge in the holes. Here you want to make note of where they're driving in those pocket holes so that you can offset them slightly for the stretcher glue up. Because if we place all of our pocket holes in the same spot on all of our stretchers, they're going to run into each other when we do the glue up. But the good thing about pocket holes is they're relatively quick to plunge and they work out great. 
So with all of our pocket holes done, I could go ahead and start attaching the stretchers. So I first apply a little bit of glue to either end and then attach the drawer front stretchers flush with the front of the case. Now, obviously it's also important that these sit flush with the top of the case so that when we drive screws in later on, they'll pull everything flat. And I probably should have mentioned this earlier during the assembly, but that's another reason that I'm putting this case together on my bench. I know that my bench is perfectly flat, so I'm going to use that as my reference piece. If you don't have a flat surface to work off of like a bench, you could work off of the top of your table saw, which I actually do later on in this build. So with the stretchers all connected, I went ahead and attached the feet. And I'm doing this now because in the next step, I'm going to do the edge banding and getting to these feet is gonna be a lot more difficult. I'm also placing my feet on the inside of my case so that they're less of a tripping hazard. The only downside is I have to drill some holes in the top of my shelves so that I can adjust these feet later on, but I think that's a pretty solid compromise. And since I designed my outfeed table to sit about three quarters of an inch lower than the top of my table saw, these adjustable feet will allow me to flush up the tops. All right, so next it was time to address that edge banding. And for my edge banding, I'm gonna be using some four quarter walnut. Now, obviously for shop furniture, you can use whatever you like, but I've used a lot of cherry and walnut in my shop pieces. So I'm gonna continue with that trend with this piece. And so the first thing I needed to do was just mill down my lumber. And to do that, I'll just run my pieces through the planer to get them down to three quarters of an inch and then put a clean edge on my boards over at the joiner. From there, I can start by measuring out the height for my toe kick. And I'll just do that with my double square and then set my fence to that dimension. Here I'm just going to rip down two boards that are slightly oversized so that I can trim back to my final length in a second. And the reason I keep them slightly oversized is because I want to do mitered corners for the bottom frame. So to make sure that I have a nice flush edge to start with, I go ahead and use my miter saw to trim off my end. From there I'll take my initial measurement off the carcass, then I'll go over to my table saw and set the blade to 45 degrees. From there I can trim my first angle for my miter using a sled. Now I prefer using a sled more than I do a miter saw for this type of cut, just because I feel like I get better results that way. Then from there I can cut one more miter into my longer second board. So once I have my first mitered piece to length, I can go ahead and glue it in place. And just like with the carcass, I'll use some brad nails to hold it in place. Only this time I'll use 23 gauge instead of 18 gauge to conceal those holes. From there I take my other oversized mitered piece and use a clamp to attach it to the front. From there I can just take my pencil and scrap a line so that I can trim it down the length perfectly. Again, why measure when you don't have to? Next, I can follow that same procedure and apply a bit of glue before pinning it in place with some brad nails. Because the feet are going underneath the toe kick, we don't really have to worry about it being perfectly flat across the bottom, but we do want it nice and flush with those shelves. And then from there, I can take the measurement from my edge banding and then bring that measurement back over to the table saw. Here, I'm gonna increase that by about a 16th of an inch. This way I have a little bit of wiggle room to flush them up later on. And even though these boards will be relatively flat and straight, the strips may move a little when you rip them down. So you wanna take that into consideration and give yourself something to work with. So with that in mind, I think a good end size for this edge banding is three quarters of an inch by three quarters of an inch. Anything less just feels too tight and anything more just means more to flush down. In any case, here I like to use feather boards again, just to make sure that everything stays as close to the fence as possible and nothing kicks back. So with all my strips cut down, I next take them over to the miter saw and trim off one end. To find my height in all the pieces, I'm just gonna use my pencil and scribe a line flush at the top. Now, theoretically, all of these pieces are gonna be exactly the same, but theory isn't always reality. So I find it best to just go ahead and mark out all my pieces this way, rather than assuming that they're all gonna be the same length. So from here, I just work my way around the carcass, trimming off each piece as I go. And I do all my vertical pieces first, and then I move on to my horizontal ones. I suppose you could do your horizontal and vertical mixed, but I'm kind of a stickler for procedures, but I don't have OCD. I know because I've checked like 300 times. All right, so with all the edge banding attached, I can move on to trimming out the pieces for my drawer boxes. And to do that, again, I'm gonna turn back to the track saw. Here, what I like to do is just cut out all of my strips that I need for all my sides. I find this to be a lot faster than trimming out all my box pieces individually. From there, I'll set up a dado stack to cut in the groove for my box bottoms. And since these drawer boxes are gonna store some pretty heavy tools, I'm gonna go ahead and use half inch material for my box bottoms as well as the sides. From there, I can cut that half inch groove into each of my strips. Again, cutting in the groove this way is a lot faster than doing all these boards individually since I can knock them all out in one pass. As the shirt says, I knew this would work. And just like we did with the earlier dados, a featherboard giving downward force above the blade helps out a lot to make sure that everything is nice and even across the groove. So with all my grooves cut in, I can then take my crosscut sled and set it up to trim out the rest of my drawer parts. 
Now what I first like to do is trim out a test piece and then use that as a template for my drawer sides. So once I have that piece trimmed out, I just set up a stop block on the left side of my blade to cut out the remaining pieces for that section. Once I have all 12 boards for the sides, I can move on to the fronts and backs. Now when trimming out these parts, it's important to trim off one end before you start trimming everything out. Otherwise you risk the end not being square to the rest of your drawer parts and that's gonna be a problem when you go to assemble these guys. One other thing to watch for is any play in your sled, as any slip up could run your workpiece into the blade, causing a bit of deviation. So whenever you're using a sled or a miter gauge, just make sure to take your time with a nice smooth cut, and if you need to, push the workpiece all the way through, then cut the saw off before you remove it. This way you don't risk ruining your workpiece by running it into the blade. Or at the very least, gently pull it away and then you can dust yourself off and go about your business. So after about 35 minutes, I had all my drawer parts cut out and we could move on to the assembly. Bring on the glue. So I've covered how I assemble drawer boxes a few times, but here's a quick refresher. Since these are plywood, I'm gonna go ahead and apply some glue into the groove and then a bead of glue along the edges of my two side panels. From there, I'll just assemble the box as I would normally by sliding my bottom into the front panel and then attaching my two sides. From there, I'll slide on the back panel and then use some 23 gauge brad nails to pin everything in place. Doing this creates perfectly square drawer boxes every single time and it's super easy. So if you got drawer boxes in your future, don't overthink it, just put them together and 99% of the time, they'll be 100% square and that's good enough for me. From there, I can just rinse and repeat five more times until I have all my boxes assembled. And then finally came the hour that I was not looking forward to. It was time to say goodbye to the bench. It was a good bench. So while I tear down the memories of this one, let me take a moment to say that if you're enjoying this video, hit subscribe. I make new videos about woodworking tips, tricks, and projects all the time, so subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And as you can tell by this bench, there's been a lot of them, and there's a lot more to come. Alright, so with the teardown complete, it was time to shut the metaphorical door on this one, as well as I guess the physical one, and let those boxes dry. Then the next day I could come back in the shop and start attaching the drawer slides. Now, attaching the drawer slides is pretty simple. All you really need to do is use a scrap piece of wood to act as a reference for the front of the drawer slides. Then open the slides on a flat surface, like the bench or your table saw, and butt the front of the drawer slide up against that reference piece. Since everything should remain flat, all you have to do from there is screw in a couple screws and remove the slide mount. Now, the cool thing about these drawer slides is they're soft close, but they're full extension and pretty cheap at only $9 a pair. So if you'd like to check them out, I'll leave a link down in the description. I've used these slides on a couple of different projects in the shop, and for shop furniture, I think they're perfect, but obviously they're not as nice as Bloom Undermount slides, so don't get too excited. However, like the first three Star Wars episodes, they get the job done. So to attach the slides to the case, I just cut out a few scrap pieces to act as spacers and set the front of the drawer slide to the edge of my edge banding. For the bottom shelf, I just use a couple of shims to lift it off the bottom slightly so that I don't get any rubbing, and then pop the shims out with a flathead screwdriver. And then from there, I can test the fit of all my drawer boxes, making any adjustments if necessary. Now, like all drawer slides, they are snug on the first push, but after that, the soft close action seems to work all right for me. It's just like how I only like soft leather. My opinion will never be swayed. All right, so next it was time to cut out my drawer fronts. And for this, I'm going for a continuous grain pattern since I have panels that are large enough to fit it. So the first thing I need to do is cut down my oversized panel over at the table saw. From there, I'll rotate the piece to trim off the factory edge, and with my width set, I can rip my second board to its final width. The only downside at this point was that I didn't have my outfeed table anymore, so in hindsight, I probably should have waited to cut that down, but hey, two roller stands get the job done. Next, I could set up a stop on my sled to trim the drawer fronts to their final height. Cutting down these panels is again where a large sled like this shines, and just as a side note, there is a build video for this one for anyone who wants to check it out. Alright, so with all my panels cut down, I could go ahead and start laying out the position for my poles. And the reason I'm doing this now is because I'm going to attach these drawer fronts using the hardware holes to secure them to my drawer boxes. And that'll make more sense here in a second. So first what I need to do is measure obviously from left to right, and then center my markings from top to bottom. From there I use an awl to set up a target for my brad point bit, then take the drawer fronts over to my drill press and plunge the holes. Here I'm not super worried about the minimal amount of tear out I'm going to get on the back of these holes, but if you were so inclined, you could add a piece of painter's tape to the back to avoid it altogether. And if you don't have a drill press in your shop, don't worry, you could easily just do this with a hand drill. So with all my hardware holes plunged, I could drop the drawer front onto the case. And then from there, I'm going to use some 16th of an inch shims to give me equal spacing around my drawer fronts. 
And all I'm gonna do is drive some screws into those hardware holes to align those drawer fronts on the boxes. See, a quick and easy way to get drawer fronts attached. Now in the past, I've attached drawer fronts with CA glue, double stick tape, and just screws. But this honestly is my new favorite way to do these. But let me know what your favorite way to attach drawer fronts is down in the comments. Is it CA glue, double stick tape, or just screws? I'd love to hear what you guys are doing in your shop. And as always, I'll reply to your comments first because you guys are paying attention. All right, so once I have the drawer box removed from the carcass, what I do is drive in two screws from the back side. From there, I can remove my two alignment screws and then plunge two holes all the way through the box. Since we drilled these with the drill press, they are aligned straight, so attaching the hardware is pretty easy. From there, we can just attach the pull hardware bolts through the back of the holes, and Bob's your uncle. Well, actually, my uncle's name is Jerry, but you get the idea. From there, we can slide all of our boxes in and check the fit. And yeah, that looks good. Next, I just took a little bit of time to fill in all the brads with some wood filler and sand everything back to 220. And since everything is already up on the bench, I figured now is as good a time as any to put a little finish on it. I'm not going to finish the entirety of the table, but it is walnut, so I figured I'd put a little bit of oil on. So with the base cabinet done, it was time to get to work on the top. So to start out, I'm going to lay out marks every six inches. This will create a crosshatch pattern across the entire top. And my plan is to drive in a screw at every one of these marks. This way, my two plywood sheets that are going to create my top will sandwich together and these screws will hold everything tight while the glue dries. Now I'm going to leave these screws in here and I'll show you how I deal with that in a little bit. But I suppose you could go back and remove them if you really felt the need to. I just don't think it's necessary for my intended purposes of the table. It's not like I'm planning on cutting through it any time, at least not intentionally. That's a lot of holes. During this process of laminating my two top pieces, I'm going to work off of my table saw. And that's because it's definitely the flattest surface I have in the shop. My workbench is pretty flat, but the table saw is pretty close to perfect. So the glue I'm going to use for this is type on three. And that's because I've had great results laminating with it in the past and I have a lot left. And for this project, I just bought this cheap roller kit at the big box store so that I can easily spread out the glue for this top. And I'll use it in a couple different places. So once I have a good amount in my tray, I apply a liberal coat to one side. And then from there, I'll just take the other piece and lay it flat on top. And if you can, it's a good idea to get some help for this part. Again, thank you, wife. Once I had my two pieces sandwiched together, I just tried to align them as best I could. And then from there, I drove screws into all my pre-drilled holes. I did have a couple spots that had some gaps, so I just pre-drilled and drove in a couple more screws in those areas. I was just sure to avoid the area where I knew my miter slots would go. If not, those miter slots would be about as useless as a history degree. I mean, there's no future in it. Alright, so with the glue dry, I just used my track saw to flush up the edges. And this also ensures a nice square top. Another option would be just to use a flush trim bit on your router, but I think this is probably a better way to go. And then from there, I can mark the underside, which is my screw top side, for the placement of the top on the case. And once I flipped everything over, I could drive in some screws and some L brackets to hold the top in place. I decided to face my screw heads down because I didn't want them to interfere with the Formica laminate we're going to adhere to the top. I don't know that it really makes a huge difference, but in my head, it makes sense. So from there, I can mark out and cut down my oversized sheet of Formica and get ready to adhere it to the top. Cutting the Formica is super easy with a circular saw. Just be careful not to bend it too much or you risk snapping it in half, which you definitely don't want to do. And to attach the Formica, I'm just going to use some rubber cement. Now, contact cement does give off a lot of fumes, so make sure you have the appropriate airflow and ventilation when you're using it. And a mask or respirator doesn't hurt either. So to apply it, I'm just going to use that same roller with a different nap that I used earlier. Again, this setup was pretty cheap, so it's all just going to go in the trash after this. But it's a lot easier and faster than doing it with a brush. And being that it looks like it just had a battle with Spider-Man, you can understand why this was destined for the can. Alright, so I let the rubber cement cure for about 30 minutes, and then it was time to connect my two sheets. Now, to make sure they don't connect prematurely, what I'm going to do is lay down some plastic between the sheet and the tabletop. And once I have everything aligned, I'll connect the end and slowly pull the plastic away. From there, I just use a J-roller to make sure that the laminate laid flat and there was no air bubbles in the middle. And it's a good thing this worked, because if it didn't, this whole section would be about as remarkable as a dry erase board. Alright, so with the Formica attached pretty securely, I could go ahead and flush trim the edge. Here, just use a combination up-down bit to go around the perimeter, taking my time so I don't take a gouge out of the edge. Now, in my experience, spiral bits work great with laminate, but straight bits work just as well, which you'll see here in a little bit. So with the Formica top complete, I had a bit more material remaining, and I decided that I was going to line the lower shelves with what I had left. This ought to make it easier to slide my tools in and out of the cabinet, and more importantly, easier to slide the miter saw in and out of it, since that's the bulkiest one I'll store. 
So all I did was again, apply some rubber cement, this time using a sponge brush and stuck my pieces down. Now you'll recall earlier, we drilled holes for our adjustments on the feet. So I just had to mark out and redrill those to make sure that I could still adjust the table. So now that I finished up the Formica, it was time to move on to the edge banding. Again here, I'm gonna use that three quarter walnut that we milled earlier. So the first step here was to rip down my pieces so that they were a 16th of an inch over my table thickness. This way I have room to flush trim everything once they're attached. Again, just like the toe kick, what I'm going for here is some oversized planks. And that's because the easiest way that I've found to do mitered frames is to do them one piece at a time. So just like before, what I'm going to do is trim off one 45 degree angle on all of my pieces. This will give me the starting point to figure out the actual length of these boards. And then from there, what I'm going to do is use some edge banding clamps to hold the edge banding against the tabletop while I mark it out. And what I'm marking out here is just the edge of the tabletop. I know that that edge mark now is where my mutter should start. So all I'm going to do is bring that piece back over to my table saw and align it with the edge of the sled. In this situation, it's best to sneak up on the cut so that you can test it out and come back and take off more material if you need to. And what we're looking for here is a nice tight miter joint. Now, since there's probably going to be a little spring in the board, try to get it as flat as you can and just know that those joints are going to tighten up slightly once you apply some glue and some pressure. And then from there, all you got to do is repeat that same process, working your way around the frame. And like I said, this process isn't just for framing out tables. You could do the same thing for picture frames or any other edge banding needs. So once I had all my frame pieces cut out, I could go ahead and attach them with some glue and some brad nails. Again, here I'm going to use 23 gauge pens to hold everything in place. Now, if you don't have these fancy band clamps, you could also just use blue tape, which I did here in some sections. So don't think they're a must for edge banding. I think blue tape's like the best gift you can get. It's either that or a broken drum. You just can't beat it. So next I turn back to my flush trim bit and flush trim the top of the edge banding to the top of the laminate. Again here, I was just careful to take things slow so I didn't take a chunk out of the top of my edge banding or even worse, the Formica. And this is a side note, you can use any color for mica that you want. I chose to go with black because it's a little bit better for filming. And honestly, I just think it looks good in the shop. So with everything flush, I could add a little bit of a round over and then adjust the table height so that I could mark out my miter slots. Now these slots are gonna vary slightly depending on how large of a sled you use on your table saw. Since my sled is on the larger side, I did have to extend my slots about 18 inches. This will give me plenty of room to push the sled all the way through the saw blade. So just take that into consideration with whatever size slots you choose to do. It'd be a huge bummer to get everything together only to find out that your sled won't go all the way through your blade during a cross cut. So with my miter slot location marked out, I went ahead and widened those lines by about a 16th of an inch just to give those miter slots a little bit of wiggle room. We're not looking for them to be exact here since the majority of the work's gonna be done at the actual table saw. This is just to give our sled some clearance. And then from there, I could use my router to take a couple passes and cut in the grooves. Now I started these cuts with an upcut bit and I was kind of worried that I was going to peel up the laminate and it didn't on the initial cut, but it did on my second pass. So on my second groove, I swapped out my spiral bit for a straight bit and it worked flawlessly. So just keep it simple. And while I finish up that second cut, let me just take a second to say that if you're enjoying these videos and you want to support the channel, I'd like to invite you to join my Patreon. There you'll get discount codes on project plans, merch, and an invite to the Discord server where we can talk about your projects and what I have going on in the shop. So if that sounds like something that would interest you, be sure to check out the link down below. And again, to all you guys who've already joined, thank you so much for your support. Your contributions go directly to these videos, so I really appreciate it. All right, let's get back in the groove. So once I had both my grooves routed in, I went ahead and used my chisels to square off that rounded edge. Now, if you wanted to, you could just knock off that peak and keep everything rounded, but I decided to square everything off since the rest of the table has pretty hard edges. Just know that laminate feels a little spongy under a chisel, so be careful not to overshoot your mark if you're chiseling it out. Next up, it was time for the finishing touches. So here I just used some wood filler in those pinholes again, and then hand sanded around my entire perimeter, being sure to break all the hard edges. And then from there, I just used my roundover bit to soften the look of the drawer fronts, and again, remove that hard edge. Next, I applied some of that same finish that I applied to the walnut to the front of the drawers, and they were ready to go in place. But prior to popping them in, I did set the height of the outfeed table to just below the height of the table saw. Since the feet are concealed, we have to adjust the height of the table prior to inserting the drawers. But with everything set, the drawers went in nice and easily, and look at that smooth motion. Alright, so early on I mentioned that my compressor would also live in this cabinet. So now that everything's together, what I'm going to do is punch two holes in the back side of the cabinet that are going to allow for the air hose as well as the power cord to pop through. Now, if you're building this project, these are obviously going to vary depending on your model. So take the measurements directly off your compressor and make the adjustments. Though in my design, I did leave a lot of wiggle room in there. 
And then from there, I could slide in my compressor, my miter saw, and my spindle sander. Again, these shelves are great for getting these large tools out of the way, since I don't use them super frequently. Next, I attach a power strip on the bottom right side, so I have easy access to outlets for my hand tools. And then from there, I just segmented out a few of the drawers so that I could take advantage of all the space and keep things a little bit more organized. And then all that was left was to close everything up and check out how it turned out. You know, I gotta say, I'm stoked on how this one turned out. My main goals for this table were to A, build a cabinet to store some of my bulkier tools, and B, create an outfeed and assembly table that was an all-in-one solution to take up less space in my shop. Now, not only do I think this is a great outfeed and assembly table, but it's also a massive storage upgrade for the shop. Now, is it gonna stay as flat as a torsion box? Probably not, but it's plenty flat for the furniture I build, and it's super nice to finally have a true outfeed table. And as far as shop furniture goes, it should be functional and again, reflect the type of furniture you wanna make. And I wholeheartedly believe that. So for me, I think this hits the nail on the head. I think the Baltic birch and walnut accent fits perfectly in the shop and the storage gives me a ton of room and gets those bulkier power tools out of the way. So if you enjoyed this build, check out this video over here next. Subscribe so you don't miss the next one. And like always, I knew this would work and I'll see you next time.